Thank you, Carlos. And good morning to everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Yep. <laughs> Welcome to All Faiths Unitarian Congregation. My name is Michelle Gemma, and I will be leading our service today. Here, you will find a diverse and inclusive spiritual community where we welcome people with many faith, beliefs and faiths. You can bring your whole self, your full identity, your questioning mind, and your expansive heart. Here at All Faiths, we have more than one way of experience in the world in understanding the sacred. So, no matter who you are, when, wherever you are on your spiritual journey, and no matter whom you love, you are truly welcome here. Is anyone here visiting for the first or second time? Please raise your hand. Thank you, Dawn. <laughs> My sister. <laughs> Can you tell? <laughs> Sorry. Well, we're glad to have you here today, Dawn. Thank you. And if you'd like to know more about us, just ask me. <laughs> And I will be more than happy to tell you all about us. <laughs> and anyone else that's out there that's interested in joining or finding out more about us, please see Fran Way in the back. She's our membership queen. And you can go to our website, allfaithsuu.org. I have a few announcements today. So during the month of August, we will share the plate with Operation Joy for their back to school project. If you would like to contribute, make out your check to All Faiths and write Op Joy on the lower left corner. And today we will have our land acknowledgement. We honor and greet the ancestors and descendants of the Calusa people whose land My sister, it's on, it's on, <laughs> ask my sister Dawn Whalen to come on up and light the chalice for us, and we will recite the words together. Please, okay. <laughs> In the mystery of life, about us there is light. It gives us a place to be, to grow, to rejoice together. Uh, ways and below. In this place of friendship, there is freedom. Let the light we kindle go before us, strong in help, wide in goodwill, inviting the day to come on and turn off the news. So uh, I just had eye surgery. I feel like an old, told Donnelly this morning, I feel like an old car with replacement parts. Uh, I had a new eye put in on Wednesday, and on Tuesday I'm going to get new hearing aids. And a few months ago I got a partial plate on my lower teeth. <laughs> and, you know, we got to keep those doctors in their palaces. <laughs> so, anyway, there's lots to celebrate. We're living in an age of miracles. So at this time, I invite you to come forward if you have any joys or sorrows that you'd like to share with us. And I love her shirt. You got to see this. Um, 
uh, Sharon Gray, and I guess it's a sad or sorrow. I've said many times with some of the things for the last five years that my daughter has been going through, and several months ago she was diagnosed with heart failure, and uh, it's heart muscle and electrical. They believe it was caused by a virus, but she was showing signs before COVID. So um, she's waiting to be scheduled for a pacemaker and defibrillator. We hold her in her heart with, with some other family members. So Wayne, happy birthday, and let's all sing happy birthday. <laughs> One of the things I've realized about growing older is how good people are. They open the doors for me, they lift things, <laughs> you know, and, and they celebrate with me. So it's a good time, and thank you for your congratulations on being 86. And when we are so grateful for your founding all faiths. And it, it's been such a pleasure all these years to work together with you and with all of the wonderful people here in creating this kind of a congregation where we do honor and get inspiration from all the faiths of the world. And a lot of that came from Wayne's background. He started out as Holy Pentecostalist, then he was a Methodist, then he became a Unitarian, so he took the journey, and uh, we're, we're just so grateful, Wayne. I'm lighting this candle for all of you who have joys and sorrows in your hearts. May you reach out to those who cannot be with us and give them your loving care and support. Thank you. Now, I'd like to ask everyone to close your eyes, take a deep, deep cleansing breath, and let us turn our minds and our hearts to today's service and to contemplate our blessings. Don't want you falling asleep. <laughs> so, if you could please rise now, because you're awake, <laughs> in body and spirit, or spirit, as we sing together hymn number 123, Spirit of Life.
Our opening words today are by Wren Bellevance Grace. I actually met her. She's a Unitarian specialist in Ma uh, Massachusetts. She came to our church a few times and got us, we were lay led and gave us a lot of great ideas. So she wrote, in praise of technology and social media, in praise of computers and routers and servicers, servers and all the hardware and software that can help us build our co connectedness, software that can help us build our connectedness. In praise of all the gremlins that live in the machines and bug our programs and help us to practice patience. In praise of the trolls who dwell in the internet and push us to live, our, live out our first principle in real time. In praise of power surges that eat our data and devour our final draft for giving us the opportunity to rebuild and remember that our work is as much transient as it is transcendent. In praise of the error, page not found, <laughs> which reminds us that with some people we need to find new paths to make connections because not everyone uses the same keyboards or the same keywords. In praise of servers that drop our connections, which remind us that all who serve have built-in limits to their capacity. In praise of communication and connection, whether it is face-to-face -face or Facebook to Facebook. We always risk errors, hurt feelings, and misunderstanding, but it is also always worth the risk. I heard you on the wireless back in 52 Lying awake in 70 tuning in on you if I was young, I didn't stop you coming through. Oh, oh, oh. They took the credit for your second symphony, rewritten by machine and new technology. And now I understand the problems you can see. Oh, oh, oh. I met your children. Oh, oh, oh. What did you tell them? Video killed the radio star. Video killed the radio star. Pictures came and broke your heart. And now we meet in an abandoned studio. We hear the playback and it seems too far ago. And now remember the jingles used to go. Oh, oh, oh. We were the first ones. Oh, oh, oh. You were the last ones. Video killed the radio star. Video killed the radio star. In my mind and in my car. You can't rewind. We've gone too far.
you. Our reading today, Accepting Change by Kerry Siganis. Change is what makes life interesting and amazing. It teaches us profound lessons and promotes growth and wisdom. It can take us to faraway places or deep within ourselves. It creates exciting opportunities and yes, sometimes it breaks our heart. It's whatever weaves the tapestry of our lives together, creating a colorful patchwork of experiences, emotions, thoughts, and relationships that make up our existence. Embrace it and do your best to enjoy the ride. If properly harnessed, change can inspire you to be the greatest version of yourself. Now, if you could please ride in body of spirit again, we will sing hymn number 354, We Laugh, We Cry. <laughs> just to have some light alone. But most of all, we need those friends we can call our very own. And we believe in life, and we the strength of love, and we have found a need to be together. We have our hearts to give we have our thoughts to receive and we believe that sharing is an answer a child is born among us and feel a special glow we see the times of youth as a watch the baby grow thrilled to hear the Aiken Nation greeting of the We dedicate our minds and hearts to the spirit of this child, and we believe in life and in the strength of love, and we have found a time to be together. With the grace of age, we have the wonder of you, and we believe that growing is an answer. Our lives are full of wonder, our times is very brief. The death of one among us fills us all with pain. But as we live, so shall we die, and when our lives are done, the memories of shared with on, and we believe in life, and in the strength of love, and in the found a place to be together. Well, today's message comes from Regina. I think there's no real big introduction. We all know her, we all love her. And can't wait to hear what you have to say. 
Come on with Yay, Regina. Well, good morning. Good morning. When Joyce Rame asked me to speak a couple of months ago, she happened to mention that today is National Friendship Day. So I started reflecting on the friendships that I've had over the years, and it immediately took me back to my youth and the neighborhood kids I grew up with. And I don't talk much about my childhood because it's all water long under the bridge now, but I do regret that, I, that it's taken me so long to really appreciate those rich personal relationships I had with people who were such an important part of my life at that time. And then I started wondering if kids today even grow up with neighborhood friends anymore? Or has social media changed the dynamics of in-person relationships? How many of you are on social media? Well, today you're all on social media because we live stream our services <laughs> and it gets even better after we live stream them we upload them to our YouTube channel where they will live in cyberspace forever and ever and ever. <laughs> and while I have nothing to hide or bad to say, it does take away a certain element of privacy that I'm comfortable with. Social media platforms have been around since 2004. It started with the launch of MySpace, then came Skype, then Facebook, then YouTube, then Twitter, then Tumblr, then Pinterest, then Instagram, then Reddit, then Snapchat, then TikTok, and there's hundreds more. And if any of those, those platforms ban you because of your posts about the January 6th attack on the Capitol, well, then you can start your own social media platform and call it Truth Social. <laughs> yes, it certainly seems like social media has taken over the world, but the question is, for better or worse? How many think better? How many think worse? Wow, big difference. Well, I'll tell you what I think a little bit later. And I'm not an expert and I don't have a lot of statistics. I'm just here today speaking from my own personal experiences. I would recommend, however, if you have not seen it, to watch the 2020 Netflix film, The Social Dilemma. Tech experts from Silicon Valley talk about the dangerous impact of social networks and how big tech manipulates and influences users of social media. And we all know by now that these platforms use algorithms to target individuals, uh, to target individuals by what they search for and what they click on. But it goes much deeper than that. It is dangerously affecting people's lives, especially the lives of teenage girls. Now, I happen to grow up in much simpler times, and I know some of you will find it hard to believe, but I grew up in the 60s and the 70s in upstate New York on a little street called Perry Road in a little hamlet called Spiegeltown with my parents and three older sisters. We lived in a little white two-bedroom house that my father built. Spiegeltown was God's country. We were surrounded by dairy farms and thick woods and lush rolling green hills and ponds and apple orchards. It truly was as iconic as a Norman Rockwell painting. I remember my parents had a party line where you picked up the phone and there was an operator on there and they would connect you to your neighbor. Then came the rotary dial phone. We had a big yellow one that hung on our kitchen wall and I still remember the number, Bedford 5, 4720. Those were much simpler times. There were no ring doorbells or security systems or computers. <laughs> Big Brother wasn't watching or listening to everything we did, or at least we didn't think he was. And they were also more private times. No one would ever ask how much your parents earned or what they paid for their house or who they voted for. Mm -mm. People just didn't air their personal information back then. And your family secrets, they never left the house. I hung out with the same small group of neighborhood friends from kindergarten all the way through high school. There was me and another girl, Carol, and six or seven boys. None of our families were well off financially, and our mothers and fathers both had to work to pay the American dream, a home on Perry Road. 
I think my mic keeps cutting out. You want to give me the hand mic? Anyway, I hung out with the same small group of friends from kindergarten all the way through high school, and there was a girl named Carol and six or seven boys. None of our families were well off financially, and our mothers and fathers both had to work to pay for their American dream, a home on Perry Road. So that left us kids on our own. We were always together after school and over the long, hot summers. We had all come from troubled homes of one sort or another. Alcohol addiction was a big problem on Perry Road. But there was also other demons too. Drug abuse, domestic violence, mental illness, and tragedies. There were a lot of tragedies in my little town. But people didn't talk about things back then to each other or to their children. They were all just faint, they were, there were all only just faint rumors of things like cancer, suicide, or the pedophile that lived down the road or the kid who might be gay. All the adults walked around pretending everything was fine and trying to hide the dirty little skeletons living in their closets. But us kids knew. The kids always know what goes on behind closed doors. From as early as I can remember, I was an insecure child. I was afraid of everything and everybody. I was extremely sensitive. I had no self-esteem, no confidence. I was anxious and nervous all the time. And I had trouble learning in school. I'm much better now. <laughs> there was no therapy back then, unless you had a lot of money. Teachers didn't ask what was going on at home, and if they did, you certainly weren't going to tell them. There were no support groups or allies or teledoctors, but there was my group of neighborhood friends, and we all managed to survive our troubled childhoods because we had each other, and we had a tree fort. We had the best tree fort you could imagine. It was deep in the woods next to a running creek. I don't know who originally built the fort, but we were the youngest kids in our families, and we all had older siblings, and they all had older siblings, and the tree fort was just kind of passed down and managed by whatever kids were there at the time. The fort was built between four huge tree trunks that emerged from one spot in the ground, and it was sturdy, made from plywood and chicken wire, and anything else that would serve as a floor or a wall or a roof. And it was a long way up to, probably as high as this ceiling. You had to climb up on the inside of the tree trunks, and you had to put your feet on certain uh, branches. You had to weave through certain branches and step on certain knots and a, an occasional two by four scrap nailed to one of the trunks. And it was not an easy climb. If you fell, it was a long drop down into a cold, running, rocky creek. And while we didn't realize it at the time, that fort would turn out to be our safest, most sacred spot, our gathering place, our sanctuary. It was also the place where everyone experienced their first kiss and smoked their first cigarette and tried alcohol for the first time, and not the last time. We planned things there, when and where for kickball, or baseball, or bicycle trips. Uh, we planned hikes in the woods and explored old abandoned barns and swimming holes. We picked wild raspberries and blackberries and rhubarb. We took things apart and put them back together again, toasters, motors, bicycles, anything we could find. And when bad things happened at home, it was the place where we all knew we could talk about it. We listened to each other, we cried with each other, we encouraged each other and we learned how not to be so afraid. We were kids taking care of kids. It was in that tree fort I recognized today where I first experienced community, kindness, empathy, and compassion. And I dreamed of getting away. So after high school, my friends and I all started going our different ways. Carol and I branched off into our own lives. We had jobs and boyfriends. We were both on the move geographically but we always kept in touch. Sometimes years would pass before we saw each other again, but we both had birthdays in July, and a year never passed that we didn't wish each other a happy birthday. Well, you have to say a lot more when you're not the worship associate. <laughs> 
So anyway, when I told Carol in 2009 that I was moving to Florida, she said, oh, you should get on Facebook. It's a good way to keep in touch. So I did. I got on Facebook. And it was a good way to keep in touch. Then I started getting friend requests from my old neighborhood friends and classmates that I hadn't heard from in 35 years or more. Several of my high school friends lived right here in Florida. This was great. I was so excited to know what happened to everyone. And while none of us ever talked about the past, for the next six years or so, we would enjoy sharing pictures and memes and recipes and the occasional obituary. It brought me comfort to reconnect with these old friends of mine, and I enjoyed it. Then in 2015, a strange thing happened. Donald Trump announced that he was running for President of the United States. By the time he was elected in 2016, and much to my surprise, I had become a woke, bleeding heart, radical, left-wing liberal, <laughs> trying to take away everyone's guns and kill babies. I was shocked at how many of my long-lost, newly found friends on social media were Trump supporters. And as all of you out there on social media know, things only got uglier and uglier from there. There was no conversations, no civility, no explaining why you felt the way you did, just hate spewing from everyone who had a different opinion than me. Sadly, and by choice, my friend list started to rapidly dwindle. I couldn't understand how so many of these people I once had so much in common with could be so different than me now. What happened to them? I started to feel really bad and sad, and I was beginning to regret reconnecting with them. I didn't really know any of them. They were better, kinder people when they were just childhood memories. And although Carol and I are still friends on Facebook, we don't follow each other anymore, and that works for both of us. I don't spend much time personally on Facebook anymore because I don't like what it's evolved into. But I do follow and post on our All Faiths pages. This congregation relied on social media and new technology <coughs> to keep us connected during COVID. We were able to live stream our services to an isolated congregation and offer programs through Zoom. And we continue today to live stream our services to a broader audience and the homebound. We use it to promote what we, as a religious organization, value and believe in. It helped us all check on each other after the hurricane and find resources for shelter and food. There's marketplaces and job boards and support groups that all really greatly benefit people. We can even chat with our felt, we can chat and follow our former minister in London if we want to. It's nice to get a firsthand account with pictures of what it's like to live in London. And as an aside, ever since CJ moved to London, I'm constantly calculating London time in my head. <laughs> I'm going to the grocery store. Oh, it's 6 o'clock in London. <laughs> <laughs> but you can certainly use social media platforms to hurt people among impressionable teenage girls. And the consequences are very few, although that is beginning to change with the inception of social media law centers working to hold social media companies accountable for the harm they inflict on vulnerable users. According to a study of the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychology, and this was before the COVID, this was in 2018, before the pandemic, 90% of teens aged 13 to 17 have used social media. 75% report having at least one active social media profile and 51% report visiting a social media site at least daily. Two-thirds of teenagers have their own mobile devices with internet capabilities, and that's not their fault. We have become a society that is dependent on our smartphones. When was the last time you left home without it and kept going? <laughs> and the frightening part about that is these little devices that we carry with us everywhere they track every move we make. Your phone tracks every place you've been, every phone call and text you've made. It tracks your personal IDs and your passwords, every internet search you've made, and everything you've ever told Siri or Alexa. It can save your life if you're lost in the woods or put you right smack dab at the scene of the crime. 
I do watch a lot of court TV because I am a true crime junkie. <clears throat> and I'm telling you, it's always the phone that is going to do you in. <laughs> Forensics can actually pinpoint where you stopped your car on the side of the road, how long you sat in it before you got out, how many steps you took to get to the field where you chucked the dead guy's phone, <laughs> and they can even tell if you tossed it f flat like a frisbee or overhand like a baseball. Now, that's a little mortifying to me. So smartphones have become the new DNA, so be careful what you do out there. <laughs> but getting back to social media, has it changed the world for better or worse? I don't know. I don't think social media itself is the problem. It's the way we use it. As with most things in life, it's a choice. We can choose to use the nostalgia of the past while also recognizing the potential of the future and the impact of new media on the evolution of communication in years to come. The lyrics refer to a period of technological change in the 1960s, the desire to remember the past, and the disappointment that children of the current generation would not appreciate the past. But video didn't kill the radio star. Radio is alive and well. And I don't think social media can kill the richness of in-person relationships. It has, in fact, given me a completely new appreciation for my childhood and the simpler, more private times I grew up in. Who knows? Maybe one day those living in the era of artificial intelligence will look back on their childhoods on social media and find some new appreciation. Today, All Faiths is my tree fort. It's my safe place, my sanctuary. I can't imagine navigating the world we live in today without all of you. I feel so blessed to be a part of this congregation. Within these walls, I can be who I really am. And I can live my values side by side with all of you. We are all here seeking community and what is good and what is right. And we make a difference in the world. The world is a better place because of all faiths and because of you. Today, on this National Friendship Day, you are all my most valued and important friends. You inspire me. You give me a sense of self-worth and purpose. And I appreciate all of you more than you will ever know. <laughs> I have Joyce Ramey syndrome. I cry. <laughs> anyway, I will leave you with an excerpt from an article from The Atlantic Magazine written by Ian Bogost, and it's entitled, the age of social media is ending. He says, quote, it's over. Facebook is in decline, Twitter in chaos. Mark Zuckerberg's empire has lost hundreds of billions of dollars in value and laid off 11,000 people with its ad business in peril and its metaverse fantasies in irons. Elon Musk's takeover of Twitter has caused advertisers to pull spending and power users to shun the platform or at least tweet a lot about doing so. It's never felt more plausible that the age of social media might end, and soon, end quote. I guess we'll have to see. Thank you. Thank you. Well, at All Face, we appreciate your generous donations for which support our dedicated staff and our beautiful facilities, inspiring services, and interesting activities and social outreach. If you are with us on a live stream service, you can mail checks or visit our website at allfaithsuu.org. And in keeping with tradition, I have an offertory joke because laughter makes you more generous. Okay, so three kids are hanging out in a tree fort bragging about their fathers. One kid says, my father puts words on a piece of paper. He calls it a poem and he gets $50 for it. The second kid said, well, my father puts words on a piece of paper. He calls it a song and he gets $150 for it. And the third kid says, well, my father puts words on a piece of paper. He calls it a sermon, and it takes six people to collect the money. <laughs> Our morning offering will now be taken. Thank 
Thank you for being a friend Travel down the road and back again Your heart is true You're a pal and a confidant I'm not ashamed to say I hope it always will stay this way My hat is off Won't you stand up and take a bow everyone you knew Well you see the biggest gift would be from me and the card attached would say thank you for being a friend 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 It's a car you lack I'll surely buy you a Cadillac Whatever you need Any time of the day or night I'm not ashamed to say I hope it always will stay this way My hat is off Won't you stand up and take a bow With walking canes and hair of gray Have no fear, even though it's hardly here I will stand real close and say Thank you for being a friend, I want to thank you Thank you for being a friend, I want to thank you Thank you for being a friend, I want to thank you Thank you for being a friend Thank you for being a friend, I want to thank you. Thank you for being a friend, I want to thank you. Thank you for being a friend, I want to thank you. Thank you for being a friend. Thank you, Paul. Our closing words are so are we bound together by elizabeth lerner mcclay as drops of rain that find each other and build to become a track a rivulet a stream a river a sea so are drawn together are we fortunate enough to find each other so are we bound together on this shared passage towards an unknown ocean and eternity This song is from Regina. She suggested this. I hope it goes along well. And it proves the point that video killed the radio star because technology is going to replace my piano playing. You gotta find your people, the ones that make you feel all right, the kind you wanna stay up with all night. You gotta find your people, the ones that make you feel whole, that won't leave your side when you lose control, the ones that won't let you lose your soul. You gotta find your people, the ones that get your joke, who will understand what you're saying for a word is spoke. You gotta find your people that put the needle in the groove. When you're together, you got nothing to prove. When you're together, you got nothing to lose. Everybody needs help. 
You gotta find your people before you find yourself. You gotta find your people that'll call your bluff. Pull right along when the road is rough. You gotta find your people, the ones that make you feel equal. They pick you up and don't put you down. Help you find your way if you're lost and found. In a world full of strangers, you don't know who to trust. All you see is danger, trying to find what you lost. You can't go it alone. Everybody needs help. You gotta find your people, then you find yourself. The one that understands you, the ones that lend a hand to you, the ones that don't demand anything from you. You gotta find your people, the ones that make you feel all right, that tell you the truth and wish you well. You gotta find your people, then you find yourself. You gotta find your people, then you find yourself. Thank you. Thank you, Carlos. Thank you. So today we want to thank Regina Martin for such a lovely, exciting <laughs> sermon. I really love that. Um, thank you, Carlos, for the music. Sharon Gray on the camera. Ed Elrod on sound. Joe Gayton, our sexton. Joyce Schaefer, beautiful flowers as always. Nicole Racine and Frank for the hospitality and our friendly greeters. It is good to be together and connected in every way we can. Now, if my sister Dawn would come up again, now to extinguish it. 